and referrals to treatment when appropriate, access to at least one of the FDA approved medications for opioid use disorder, such as buprenorphine or methadone, treatment for pregnant women with OUD, on-site peer recovery services, and consultations with individuals upon their release from incarceration to develop reentry plans. These programs are vitally important because justice-involved individuals with substance use disorder are among the most at risk for overdose. Individuals leaving incarceration without support are even more at risk. This legislation and the funding opportunity can help break the cycle, and it will increase the chances for justice-involved individuals to achieve lasting recovery. Through this program, the OCC will distribute $8 million to the top scoring proposals that we receive and each grant project proposal can request up to $500,000 to support programs that are required by the legislation. We'll be accepting applications for the grant program through March 21st, and we'll announce our funding decisions on April the 2nd, or excuse me, April 21st. During this session, Khalil Kuter, the OOCC's grant program coordinator, will review the requirements that the o of the OOCC's application in detail this will include an in-depth look at all the scoring criteria so that you'll know exactly what we're looking for in each section. Our goal is that every jurisdiction, regardless of the size or resources, will have an opportunity to write thorough and effective proposals and can be begin implementation of these programs to the best of their abilities. We're also pleased to be partnering with the Washington Baltimore High, High Intensity Drug Trafficking Area, or HIDA, on this initiative. Following the webinar, HIDA will be offering two additional training sessions for jurisdictions as they prepare their applications. You'll hear more about this opportunity in just a moment for, with um, Dr. Laura Papard from HIDA and also Dr. Shannon Robinson with Health Management Associates. This grant opportunity marks the beginning of a new chapter of Maryland's response to the opioid crisis. The $8 million that we're using to fund this program represent the first use of money from Maryland's Opioid Restitution Fund. The Opioid Restitution Fund, or the ORF, was established in 2019 to receive any financial settlements with prescription opioid manufacturers and distributors. The ORF requires that any money that Maryland receive, receives be used to directly address the harms of the opioid crisis, such as through expanding access to treatment services and medications for opioid use disorder, which are among our best tools for reducing the risk of overdose. And we can think of no better way to begin using these funds than by expanding resources for the most at-risk populations. So again, I just wanna thank everybody again for um, joining us today and for taking advantage of the resources that are being made available to you. This work is so very important and we greatly look forward to reviewing your proposals. And we're committed, the OCC is committed to helping you and supporting you every step of the way as we move forward. And with that, I will now uh, hand it over to Dr. Papard and Dr. Robinson to give a brief overview of the technical assistance opportunity through HIDA, and then we'll go to Khalil to review the OOCC's grant application process. So Dr. Papard and Dr. Robinson, over to you. Thank you for joining. Thank you, Robin. The Washington Baltimore HIDA is very excited to be partnering with you guys on this initiative, and this is why. The Washington Baltimore HIDA, our mission really is to disrupt and dismantle drug trafficking. We also have initiatives designed to improve the efficiency and effectiveness of the work that we do, but we have an arm for treatment and prevention within the National HIDA program at large, and also within the Washington Baltimore HIDA, we fund several treatment sites across our region, which includes Virginia, Maryland, DC, and the Eastern Panhandle of West Virginia. So we have two specific shared goals with you all in this realm, and they are to reduce recidivism and to increase access to treatment for the criminal justice population that are struggling with substance use disorders. So we're very excited to be partnering with you on this. We, um, actually wanted to talk to you a little bit about the new technical assistance infrastructure that we've embedded within the Washington Baltimore HIDA under a division that we call ADAPT. And that stands for a division for advancing prevention and treatment. That initiative was born in 2019 and uh, 
has several members among its team right now. I've invited two of them to join us today because you will be seeing some of their faces. Uh, Dr. Patty Versazidis is here. She is the Assistant Director of ADAPT. Patty, if you could wave. And Julia Glockham will be serving as the Coordinator for Technical Assistance within our division, if you could wave as well. So you may be seeing both of these ladies. We have also directly partnered with Health Management Associates, and Dr. Shannon Robinson is going to talk in just a couple minutes. We're, we have had a longstanding history with them, and they are definitely content experts in this field, and you'll see why in just a second. So we're very excited to integrate them into this process and to offer these services to you together. I wanted to review what you see on your screen here so you can know what to expect from the Washington Baltimore Haida and Health Management Associates regarding uh, technical assistance over the next few months. So right up front, you'll see here on the bottom left hand corner, the orientation and preparation webinars. As Robin mentioned, these two webinars are designed to get you fully prepared, get questions answered related to important content, important ways of thinking, important best practices that you can potentially integrate into a strong proposal for your area. These webinars will occur March 1st and March 8th. Dr. Patty Fersicidis is going to post in the chat box our email, adapt at wb.haida.org. In order to meet all of your needs for these webinars, we have ideas of based on a lot of experience in the past, through HMA, we've got ideas of what we think would be most helpful for you. Beyond that though, if you have specific things you think should be covered or you would like to see covered in these two webinars, please reach out to ADAPT at adapt at wb.haida.org and send those ideas our way. We will make sure that Dr. Robinson gets that information and will address it during those two webinars. The second thing I wanna to draw to your attention to because this is a three component technical assistance package, if you will, is something we call a readiness assessment. You will have all been made aware of this assessment. It came through a flyer. We encourage you to complete that. That's in the middle here, the bottom middle of the flyer that you're looking at. If you complete this readiness assessment, and we strongly encourage all of you to do that as soon as possible, it will then generate a personalized feedback report for you, and we will make sure that gets in your hands to help you identify some of the gaps, some of the areas you might wanna strongly be paying attention to as you write your proposal. So there are multiple purposes for this readiness assessment. Dr. Robinson will share a little bit more about this with you, but that link is available. It is ready for you to take that if you have any problems accessing it or any problems in completing the assessment please again reach out through adapt at wb.haida.org. And the third component, which in our opinion really is going to be the bread and butter for this, is, um, oh, we're getting a question. Yes, Patty, is it possible to also post the link for the assessment right here in the chat? That's a great idea. Um, the bread and butter of this technical assistance based on years and years of experience that you'll hear about from HMA is going to be more of the coaching and the learning community that will be delivered to you through the TA. And right now we have that set up as around 10 coaching sessions that will more than likely be with all of you as one cohort. But what that readiness assessment will do is really give us some sense of where the needs are across all of you as applicants to make sure that we're addressing them in both a timely and a strategic manner so that you're getting everything that you need once you've been awarded and begin implementation for your project. So with that, what I'd like to do is just share with you a little bit about Dr. Robinson and hand it over to her for just a few minutes so you can get to know her a little bit better. Dr. Robinson is board certified in psychiatry and addiction medicine. She served as the first chief of addiction services for California Correctional Healthcare Services, where she was the champion change management agent while initiating medications for addiction treatment within primary care. She's participated in the development of jail-based MAT promising practices, guidelines, and resources for the field. And she's currently participating in I'm sorry, and has participated in the development of jail-based withdrawal management guidelines and resources for evaluation and treatment of substance use disorder in carceral settings. Now, she works with Health Management Associates, which is a national healthcare consulting firm. It's, it functions both um, at the national 
and state and local levels, and we've had an opportunity and have been very fortunate to work with them on several initiatives to date. And I'm excited now to turn you over to Dr. Robinson, who has a vast amount of experience in coaching and technical assistance. Dr. Robinson? I can't hear anything. Can anyone hear anything? No, Dr. Robinson, you are still on mute if you can hear us. I can. All right. Thank you. Um, sorry about that. So good morning or afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to encourage everybody to do the readiness assessment. It covers eight distinct areas. And the goal of the readiness assessment would be to help you all identify areas that you may want to ask for resources in order to improve your um, service delivery. So that's why we're um, encouraging you to do it before you write your grants to help wrap your head around um, what it is that you're getting ready to do. Some of you are already doing screening and treatment. Others are not doing, um, maybe doing screening, but not treatment. No matter where you are, knowing where you are um, and what the long-term goals are will help you in writing your grant. So the readiness assessment goes over organizational culture. It goes over staffing and training. Um, it talks about um, screening, assessment, substance use services, medication services, reentry planning, and also data collection, which is very important um, for this grant. There is a long list of data elements um, that have been chosen that will need to be reported. And so that's a little bit more about the readiness assessment. I think it would help you uh, in writing the grant. Then we are going to look at the best practices. Um, at least the current plan is that we're going to look at best practices in all of these areas uh, that the readiness assessment goes over for uh, the two upcoming webinars so that you have some ideas of what the what the end game looks like what what the goals are uh, and um, details in each of those areas not just in medication which is one small part of um, substance use disorder treatment um, but also the psychosocial services and the peer services the reentry um, piece that's necessary and then the, um, the ongoing technical assistance once the grants have been awarded. So one of the things that has been extremely successful in um, California uh, in the JailMet Learning Collaborative here has been uh, having people together, some people who have already implemented and some people who are just starting to implement, and then moving um, people forward and being able to learn from each other and um, learn about the pitfalls that uh, the people who have already implemented have experienced so that you don't have to experience those same challenges when possible, that you are able to, uh, to skip over some of those challenges when possible or to know in advance what those challenges are gonna be and how to address those challenges. So the, the learning collaborative, the learning community can be very, very helpful. And um, we just actually got data this week to say that since our learning collaborative here in California began, we've actually treated now 22,000 um, inmates. So that's really, really exciting to think that um, over the past um, three years, we have been able to treat 22,000 inmates who previously, as almost no one was getting treatment prior to the um, learning collaborative. So very exciting. Um, and I look forward to working with you all in Maryland. I'll turn it back um, over to uh, Dr. Picard or um, to our hosts. We are available if you have any questions about this technical assistance. Again, reach out via adaptatwb.hida.org and we look forward to working with you. Robin? 
Okay. All right. Khalil, do you want to um, pull up your slides? Uh, absolutely. These are, yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Khalil Kuter, the grant program coordinator for the OOCC. I'll be going over the application process as well as the scoring criteria that we use to review the applications. Um, let's move along here. So the purpose of this grant program is to distribute funding to local governments in partnership with local detention centers to meet the requirements of the Opioid Use Disorder Examination and Treatment Act of 2019. This includes, as we said before, expanding services for individuals who are justice involved, as well as expanding screening and medication availability to treat opioid use disorder in local correctional facilities. Um, regarding the interagency op opioid coordination plan, all projects should fit under one specific goal of the plan, which is expanding SUD treatment in correctional settings. Uh, the specific tactic of which is helping local detention centers become compliant with HB 116. Um, the requirements of House Bill 116 are given below here. A uh, link to the legislation is provided in the grant application document. Um, the requirements for the local detention centers are to conduct evidence-based mental health and substance use assessment, provide access to peer and behavioral health counseling services, and offer three FDA-approved forms of MOUD. The bill also requires LDCs or local detention centers to provide evaluation and treatment to pregnant women with OUD, to authorize inmates to participate in peer training programs, and establish procedures for initiating treatment for inmates with OUD, including withdrawal management, and finally, to develop reentry plans for individuals leaving incarceration. We're now going to dive into the overview of the grant program, um, starting with the pre-award stage. Uh, when discussing the pre-award stage, I want to cover the eligible parties here, the application process, and the funding specifications. Local health departments and behavioral health authorities, BHAs, are eligible to apply, as well as local detention centers. In order to apply, a completed application, budget template, and supporting documents are required. Uh, additionally, signatures from the health officer are required if the application is coming directly from a local detention center. The application can be for amounts from, as we said, $5,000 to $500,000 per application. Uh, please review the instructions for the permissible and impermissible costs. Moving on through the application, the very top has a space for the project title, jurisdiction, and applicant organization. The main objective should be related to the Opioid Use Disorder Examination and Treatment Act uh, in reference to the bill text. A standard template for the project summary would include the items that you see here on the screen, and it should be succinct and clear. There are other areas in the application to expand on the timeline, budget items, and performance targets. The next section is going to be your problem statement, which is where you'll want to describe why the project is needed, the most significant issues, problems, or trends, or opportunities, as well as the target population. Um, again, try to be succinct, and there are some resources here that you can use as well to support your problem statement. Next, we're going to discuss the program goals and objectives. You'll want to define them. You will want to use these to define the central aim and principal goals of the project. For each goal, you'll want to define one to three key objectives. For example, if goal one were to establish certain procedures or standards to determine opioid use disorder and treatment of inmates with substance use disorder, then objective one might be from X day to X day, conduct an analysis of intake and assessment procedures at the facility. Uh, similarly, regarding program management, You'll want to identify at least one performance measure you'll use to evaluate this project's success and the target for the fiscal year. Uh, consider what documentation as well you can provide to show as evidence for these, uh, for these performance measures. Um, for example, if you have an activity type um, for on-premise access to peer recovery specialists, uh, one of your performance targets might be the number of peer recovery specialists hired or a number of persons engaged in peer recovery specialists or engaged by PRS. Uh, the timeline, uh, the next section should be presented as a table and include the key tasks, persons responsible, target dates for task completion, 
and the time frame for achieving the objectives that we just described. Moving on through the application, we have the spend plan, which will contain major categories in the project, and provide any information about other grant funding the organization might be seeking. Um, this can be presented as a timeline by month or a series of bullets for each of the budget items. And we're going to get to the budget in just a moment or the budget form. Uh, finally, we have the signatures here. Applications should be signed by the local behavioral health authority and the local health mm, local detention center official. Um, if the project included partnership with a local service provider, a signature from an authorized representative from that organization should also be present on the application. Okay, now we're going to review the budget form. Uh, the budget template is provided in Excel. Each item on the budget should have a description um, and positions and purchases should be distinct where possible and not presented in aggregate. So a line for each position that's going to be hired or included. Double check to make sure that the total at the bottom of the budget form includes all the items from the above section of the form and they roll up property, properly. Uh, there are the sections you see here on the budget form and if you have items that are not specifically included in sections A through G, they can be included in the next section, section H, which is your other costs. Um, if you have any doubts about where to put a certain expense or a certain budget item, you can reach out to us so we can give you guidance on where you might include it. Regarding indirect costs, this is calculated on specific direct costs from the categories above. Um, review your budget to make sure that this section and the calculations there are also correct. Next up, we're going to move to the reimbursement form, the reimbursement uh, process. The grant program moves, uh, provides funding on a reimbursable basis, uh, wherein the OOCC and MDH will reimburse for grant expenses. The reimbursement form is built from the budget lines from the approved budget, and as such, all the detail from the budget provided will inform the detail on the reimbursement form. Um, the bottom part here, if the grantee has an expense that's not included on the approved budget, a grant modification has to be approved. And that comes uh, later in the post-award stage when we discuss modifications. Moving up to the actual award stage, I uh, want to discuss what happens once we reach the submission deadline of March 21st, which Robin mentioned earlier. Our tentative award decision date is April 21st, a month after that. I'll be conducting an initial review when I receive applications to make sure every item is included that we require. Uh, then we are going to conduct a secondary review to make sure the application is complete uh, and that the budget is accurate to the items in the project application and vice versa. The OOCC is going to impanel a scoring committee of subject matter experts from local and state agencies to review and score the application and the criteria of which they'll be using we'll discuss in just a moment. The anticipated date for completing the scoring process and award approval process is April 15th, after which award letters and grant agreements will be prepared and issued. Uh, next, the scoring criteria are presented we have them here. Um, the first is, is the project aligned with the interagency opioid coordination plan? Is it also aligned with the requirements of the Opioid Use Disorder Examination Treatment Act? Uh, secondly, we have more specific to the application. Is there a full project summary and project statement? Does it provide for uh, support for equitable services required by House Bill 116? Does it provide specific and measurable program goals and objectives and also performance indicators, a reasonable and detailed timeline, and a detailed spend plan? So once we get through scoring, we're ready to talk about the post-award stage here. Um, consists of quarterly reporting and also reimbursement requests. Uh, in these, the grantee will submit documentation on the grant's progress and request reimbursement for grant expenses. Grantees might also be asked to participate in a site visit or a desk review, depending on the circumstances. Uh, the reporting deadline that you see here in this table is based on an April 21st award date with the first quarter falling three months after the start date. So you see if April 21st is your award, we have the months of May, June, and July for the first quarter project performance. 
30 days after the end of July, which is August 30th, that's when we will have a deadline for the first quarter's reporting. Um, that is all I have today. I want to thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Um, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat, and I'll review that now. Um, and I'll, I'll give just a moment and see if anything pops up there. Thank you, Khalil. And I know there's probably a million questions um, that everyone has. Hopefully, we can answer them. Um, and if you can't think of one now, but you want to ask later, just reach out to us. I think there was one that came up. Yeah. I have also been fielding questions from, um, from some local detention centers and some applicants that have reached out uh, outside of this through email, you can of course send questions there. Um, happy to help. And is there a question in the in the chat? I believe it's when the MIT readiness assessment tool is due to be completed. That due date, um, correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Pippard, I think it's tomorrow the 25th. She might have left and I um, I was gonna have everyone uh, ask questions of, of Haida at the end after you presented Khalil, but I think that they, they might have left already, but they're very open to questions. So we can um, give the contact information so that you can ask questions. But yeah, I think it was tomorrow. And I'm gonna um, have Michael Corey uh, reach out to all of you with an email after this is over. This is recorded, so you can always, um, Oh, there we go. She stated verbally as soon as possible this flyer was distributed via MCAA. Okay. Um, I'm going to have him send you the slides and also the links because I'm not real good at pulling up links and then the, the webinar is over and then I don't even know if you can get to them again. So he's going to send all that to you and we'll also send it to Marianne Thompson so that she can distribute to everybody um, just in case somebody missed it. Are there any other questions? Let's see. I'm going to try to do this. I'm really not good with technology. Um, I have a question from uh, Alexander Wimberly here. Do you need to have determined the local service provider prior to applying? This is information that you'll want to include on your budget sheet um, and as well as in the application. You'll want to at least identify what amount is being set aside for that contract and what specifically that contractor will do so that when you move forward and identify the provider and the contract that those two things match up exactly. Okay, and then, yeah, the, the one of the chats says the first slide states tomorrow, but we were not aware of any prior notification for this tool before the presentation. So we can ask um, if they can move it back. But I don't believe, if you pull it up, I don't think it's a, a lot of information that they're asking for. Pull it up, and if there's an issue and you need more time, let us know. But I, like I said, I don't think it's a whole bunch of questions that they're asking you. What is NCAA? What does that stand for? The Maryland Correctional Administrators Association, I think is what that is. You got it, yep. Oh, there it is. There it is. Somebody answered it on, oh, Teresa, thank you. <laughs> uh, okay, again, asking for more time. Okay, all right, any more questions? All right, I really appreciate everybody taking the time and we're just, um, thank you for all your efforts. I know it's frustrating. I, I heard everybody at the, the uh, correctional conference, how frustrating it can be, but we're, we're here to help you any way that we can, um, not just with money, but with, with support. So if you need anything else, um, I'm hoping that these other webinars and the technical assistance that Haida, we're, we're really excited that they're working with us to help um, implement this. And um, 
if there's anything else, just let us know. We'll help you any way we can. All right, everybody have a great afternoon. Don't come in here. Hi, Amy. I'm still here. Go ahead and ask your question. Hi, Khalil. Thank you. I kind of missed the, the cutoff. Um, no worries. So we just wanted to clarify, in, in looking at the HB 116 legislation, yep. um, is the requirement that correctional facilities be offering all three medications on January 1st or that they offer one medication or, you know, one or two and have a plan in place for the, the additional offerings? Does that make sense? I I would believe that the requirement is to offer all three, and if not, then as you said, have a plan in place. Um, okay. Yeah. As as kind of like a, a stair step. Okay. So yeah, that that would be the other question. If a correctional facility had difficulty, you know, implementing all three, what would then be the the recourse? But you're saying that if if that's not happening, then submission of a plan could be. I believe so. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's great. Thank you so much. Yeah. More easy questions, please. <laughs> well, that seemed hard to me, but I'm glad you thought it was easy. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Sure. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye.